Stanford University. I served once as the president of Stanford. That is a I mean, having been the president of Stanford doesn't give you much immortality. As I just realized, an alumna from the 60s asked the person she was sitting next to, and who is he? So uh, all the eight years uh, I was president, uh, with all my photos uh, spread all over, uh, I never registered with her. Uh, <laughs> so uh, being pr president of a university does not uh, uh, kind of let you get carried away by uh, the notion that maybe some people think you are influential or have power or anything like that. Uh, we are going to have a, a wonderful panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, and of course, our topic is, does public broadcasting have a future? Uh, uh, the event is uh, sponsored uh, by the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Fund, uh, the Graduate Program in Journalism, and the Department of Communications at Stanford uh, University. And uh, I know only of one person who has had a relationship with McClatchy as a director for many years uh, on its board, and that is Joan Lane sitting over there. Joan, can you recognize any other person associated with McClatchy? No. So we are very happy to have you. Uh, uh, Joan has been an immensely important person uh, uh, for Stanford for many years. She actually uh, helped the Board of Trustees throughout the years I was serving as president. So Joan is the one person in the room who does know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, thank you for coming. Uh, the question seems to imply, the question, does public broadcasting have a future, seems to imply that private broadcasting has a future. <laughs> Perhaps we should have asked whether in the age of digitization and the World Wide Web, broadcasting in general has a future. Whether other media, such as newspapers, have a future. That, of course, would have given us no focus whatsoever. Therefore, the limitation seems wise. Furthermore, few people seem to doubt that public broadcasting, at least in the United States, finds itself in a very precarious situation. I'm already losing the first member of the audience. Uh, that is very dismaying. Uh, um, I'm not much of a consumer of radio and television of any sort. I have more or less limited myself to four public outlets. NPR, BBC, the PBS NewsHour, and since we do not any longer have a classical music station on the mid-peninsula, the excellent Bavarian classical station to which I listen on the internet. And therein lies much of the story of public broadcasting <laughs> or any uh, bro bro broadcasting of any other sort. We have just the right panel to contemplate the future of public broadcasting. Uh, Ulrich Wilhelm is the Director General of the Bavarian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, Tim Olson oversees digital media for the Bay Area public broadcasting stations. Dan Werner, who will follow Mr. Wilhelm, is executive producer of McNeil Lehrer Productions and By the People, a democratic dialogue initiative. Like Mr. Wilhelm, he studied both journalism and law. Our final panelist is Shanto Yenga, the Chandler Professor of Communications and a Professor of Political Science at Stanford. Professor Yenga is an expert on the mass media, especially on how the framing of issues influences voters. And now let me take up a little more of your time by giving uh, you uh, some more information about the most exotic of our panelists. As you can see, Wilhelm looks very exo exotic. He did definitely traveled a far distance to be here with you. Public broadcasting in Germany uh, is a state rather than federal matter. Public television has two competing systems, uh, broadcasting systems, um, whose origins are so Byzantine that I shall not ex attempt to explain them here. Mr. Wilhelm heads the Bavarian Broadcasting Corporation, a major player in the first of the two television systems, and of course in radio. 
As I indicated, he is both a journalist and a lawyer, and deeply rooted in his home state of Bavaria, where he has been a journalist and then an outstanding civil servant in state government. Before becoming director, uh, director general earlier this year, he served for five years as a spokesperson for Chancellor Merkel and the German federal government. In these five years, the media offered much praise for his competence and trustworthiness, a rare accomplishment for any government spokesperson. When the chancellor visited Stanford in 2010, he accompanied her. I asked Mr. Wilhelm at breakfast whether he missed the excitement of grand politics. For five years, he was there at the very core. He could have worried about Greece the last few days <laughs> if he were still there. Uh, uh, so I asked whether he missed the excitement. All he admitted to was that he missed the dynamism and avant-garde feeling of Berlin. Now, that for a native of Munich was a major concession. <laughs> and indeed, I do not think you should tell anybody that he said so. He might not be able to return to Bavaria. <laughs> Mr. Willem. <laughs> Good afternoon. And, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kasper, for this very kind introduction. And uh, you quoted me on a very dangerous line indeed. Uh, it would be a major problem uh, if that were to be uh, known in Munich in coming back. I apologize. I prepared a speech. As a non-native speaker, I figured uh, it would be too risky to improvise the whole speech. When I was asked to speak to you here at Stanford University on the topic of the future of public broadcasting, two connections between subject and this venue sprang to mind. First, there is the motto of uh, Stanford University, Die Luft der Freiheit weht, the wind of freedom blows, a phrase coined by Ulrich von Hutten during the Reformation. In 1945, Americans brought freedom back to Germany. You restored freedom of the press and together with the British introduced public broadcasting to Germany. And second, if public broadcasting along with all established media, whether electronic or print, is currently confronted with challenges unknown until now, that also has a definite link to Stanford. After all, yours was the hand that rocked the cradle of the baby internet, which then grew up to foster a digital revolution bringing with it profound changes to both the media and journalism. I would like to begin by introducing you to the organization of public broadcasting as it exists in Germany today. I'll try to be brief on my description of the system with all its many offshoots, although my task is much like trying to explain the subtleties of baseball to a German in just a few minutes. <laughs> As I said, the Allies introduced public broadcasting to Germany after the war. Freedom of speech and press, those were essential pillars on which a post-war democratic Germany was to be built. A symbolic act occurred in my hometown of Munich, where the first issue of the brand new and now prestigious Süddeutsche Zeitung was printed from the melted down lead that once had been used for Hitler's Mein Kampf that manifesto that too few Germans read and was not taken seriously enough or far too seriously by those who did. For the mass medium of radio, we did not have television at that point. This new freedom of the press also meant that there was no longer to be a centralized state radio, which is why public broadcasting was structured on a regional basis with, for example, a station in Munich, one in Cologne, another in Hamburg and so on. Today we have a total of 12 public broadcasters which are neither under state control nor at the service of profit or other interests. To that end, a relatively complicated organization with legal underpinnings has been set up. Each broadcaster is supervised by a broadcasting board with members representing all segments of society. 
at Bavarian Broadcasting, for example, of which I am the manager, they number 47 in all, of whom only one is sent by the state government of Bavaria. 12 members come from the Bavarian Parliament and represent its constituent parties. The other 34 are named, for example, by the churches, industry, labor unions, farmers, teachers, artists, and several others. Our programs, as dictated by law, are supposed to offer information, education, and entertainment, and they are guided by democratic and humane values, cultural responsibility, and objectivity. Public, or better public service broadcasting in Germany, it doesn't just serve a small niche. Until the 1980s, we had a public service monopoly. There were no commercial radio or television networks. We have since come to serve in what we call a dual system, made up of public and commercial broadcasters. And we are still very big. Our 12 networks produce programming for approximately 20 television and 60 radio channels. As you can see, Germany is a federally organized country with a large variety of very regionally oriented television and radio programming. We enjoy about a 50% market share. The rest is divided up among various commercial television and radio stations. So, and surely by now you've asked yourselves, who pays for all this? Well, from the beginning we have, like the BBC, been financed by fees. If you own a radio or television set, you have to pay up. At present, just under 18 euros a month, which, depending on exchange rates, comes to about $25. The socially disadvantaged and the disabled are exempt. The fees for all public broadcasting stations in Germany come to about 7.5 billion euros annually, about $10 billion. I know that for you Americans, paying for basic radio and television is almost unthinkable, especially for programs that you never or almost never watch. So here you have an example of the occasionally surprising cultural differences that still exist between our two countries, despite globalization. We Germans sleep in the beds of the same international hotel chains, eat the same bad fast food, listen to the same pop music, and frequently use or abuse the English language. But there are times when we both just stand back in amazement. So it seems incredible to Germans that in the US, practically anyone, I know there are a few exceptions, can own a gun. Just as you can scarcely believe that we whiz along on our autobahns, again with exceptions, at whatever speed we like or that we Germans finance our political parties from taxes, and that we ungrudgingly pay a fee for television and radio. Of course, there are protests every now and then. Legal suits have been filed, but they've all gone nowhere. The public at large, however, accepts the fee without much fuss, primarily because people know what they have in public broadcasting. First, almost commercial-free programming, Commercials are subject to strict limitations of 20 minutes a day, none on Sundays and none on holidays, and make up only 5% of our revenues. And second, they can find sophisticated, informative programming that still retains something for everyone. We don't broadcast just the highbrow stuff, or documentaries, or dense political discussions. We also offer entertainment, movies, quiz shows, and sports, that often costs us dearly, but are immensely popular. And yes, like always in Germany, soccer is often king. The commercial networks have their movies and quiz shows and sports too, plus the standard reality fair with celebrities trying to survive in an unhospitable jungle, American Idol-like shows and other scripted reality formats. We stay clear of those. But they have almost no cultural programming few documentaries, and offer the public only a smattering of real information. We, on the contrary, provide both entertainment and the cultural programs that strictly market-oriented broadcasters could probably never offer. At Bavarian Broadcasting, we have a world-famous symphony orchestra, plus our own radio orchestra and a renowned choir. We organize music competitions and provide start-up grants for young artists. 
We were co-producers, for instance, of the 2007 Oscar-winning film The Lives of Others, which might never have been made without this contribution. Personally, I'm a big fan of PBS and NPR. They provide excellent programming in the otherwise sometimes downright bizarre world of American media and do so under very tough conditions. And since there are certain to be some folks here in the audience who are involved with them, I would like to thank you in the name of past and present correspondence that German public broadcasting has sent to America. A program, a program like NPR's All Things Considered is a great help to foreign correspondents, an important daily guidepost. Our situation is, as I've tried to make clear, very different. We are not only limited to market failure offers, but can also offer programming with mass appeal. But that can often be a difficult trade-off. Should what we broadcast be more popular or more demanding? If we were to go exclusively highbrow, we would obviously have a smaller market share and our fee would soon be called into question, along with the demand that the minority who wants to watch and listen to that stuff should pay up for it, as in the US. Well, we try to reach both a mass audience and a more sophisticated one. One great advantage of this system is that we can help lead people from popular programs to something more demanding than they would normally watch. It's a balancing act between quotas and higher goals and a constant challenge for us to be better than the commercial networks. In the 1920s, at the beginning of, the, of radio's triumphant march, a German writer named Bertolt Brecht was deeply impressed by the new medium. Bertolt Brecht, who was forced to flee from Hitler and found refuge here in California between 1941 and 47, was bothered by the one-way street of such communication. He dreamed of something that at the time was still illusionary from a technical standpoint, of a dialogue over the radio. Over the radio. Listeners should be able to reply and join in the conversation. Well, it took a long time, but Brecht's fantasies are reality today. We are now at a point where practically everyone can communicate with everyone else in the world. I'm at Stanford, no need for me to explain the potential of the Internet here. Until recently, the possibility it offers were unlimited. But here too, as I've heard Americans so aptly say, the net giveth and the net taketh away. It provides unlimited worldwide distribution at minimal cost. It facilitates dialogue, but it also tears down barriers that previously offered protections. It deprives established media, the press, television, radio, of our exclusivity. Anyone can write whatever he or she wants on the net, can tune in to audio and video. You want to hear music? You don't need a radio. To watch a movie? Why turn on the television? And you can get our news around the clock. The lead time that journalists in newsrooms used to enjoy is reduced to zero. And also, we're only at the start of the digital revolution. Its consequences are already impossible to overlook. Here in America, newspapers have been going under at a dramatic rate. Ads, both commercial and classified, have wandered away to the internet. Even the printed book sees its very existence threatened. Also, I believe books will in fact survive, as well as printed newspapers whose demise within 10 years was predicted by Steve Ballmer of Microsoft three years ago. It's not going to happen, that's my personal conviction, but the adjustment will be arduous and complex and many will perish in the process. The problem is uh, that so far no one knows precisely what form this process will take uh, to be successful. And what is true of newspapers is also true, if not quite as dramatically at the moment of radio and television, including public broadcasting in Germany, even if our fees are keeping the wolf from the door so far. But we are clearly able to see that our public, especially our younger audience, is drifting off to the internet, that those who use our media are significantly older than the population on average. Over the past 10 years, time spent with trusty TV and radio has scarcely changed. Germans on average still spend almost four hours a day watching and three hours listening. 
the internet gets 80 minutes a day of their time. And so far, that has not been at the cost of radio and TV. But we also observe that younger internet users in the 14 to 30 age group are spending more time online than with radio and television. Concurrent with this is a development that had begun before the internet, but is considerably strengthened by it. Fragmentation of audience, which Chris Anderson, the editor-in-chief of Wired, has cogently described as the long tail principle. Target audiences keep shrinking. Each individual niche has its internet experts and forum. Even with our two television and five radio stations at my network, Bavarian Broadcasting, we cannot possibly serve every individual interest. How should we respond to these challenges? There is no silver bullet. Nobody knows just how and in what direction the internet will develop. For example, we've already been hit with the novelty of smartphones and iPads and the mobile internet. To put it bluntly, when society changes, when it embraces new modes of communication, we must change with it. We must, and this is the first of the two issues I would like to explore, we must of course be present on the net. We are also going to have to be viewed online just as we are heard on the radio or watched on television. Surely by now, that's a foregone conclusion. In Germany, 21% of internet users occasionally watch television by live streaming and 29% do so by time delay. The numbers are a little lower for radio. We have been able to augment the programming of our five radio stations with three purely digital outlets. One with music aimed at young people, one with oldies, and an additional news channel which also broadcasts certain special events, including parliamentary debates. But of course, the internet is not just a new way of broadcasting our programs. We use it to enrich and expand with them uh, them with information, with images, audio and video material, and of course links. We provide live commentary for sporting events, up-to-date news, as well as weather and traffic reports. But when all is said and done, radio, television and online still function side by side, but do not really work together so far. The development of the online offerings of public broadcasting in Germany have been accompanied by an ongoing dispute with the press. Newspaper publishers would love to have the internet all to themselves. Their argument, and from their point of view it has a certain validity, is that public broadcasting, including public online broadcasting, is after all financed by fees, whereas newspapers have to pay their own way and finance it with chronically insufficient advertising. On the other hand, and this is not generally recognized, Public broadcasting cannot unhitch itself from the, advantages, uh, from the advances of the internet. That would just be digging our own grave. But while we are Germans, we do regulations, comprehensive and complicated. <laughs> For two years now, we've been working on something that would have given Mark Twain a chuckle. Our, and this is a quote, Rundfunkänderungsstaatsvertrag, one word. Twain was much amused by the German language, as you know. He said that words like Rundfunkänderungsstaatsvertrag are so long they offer a panorama. <laughs> and whenever he came across a good one, he would have it stuffed and put it in his museum. <laughs> so here Mr. Twain is a shiny new specimen for your museum of German monster words. Rundfunkänderungsstaatsvertrag. Take it apart and you'll find a law that obligates public broadcasting to observe certain restrictions when it comes to the net. All new online offerings first have to be reviewed by the governing board I described earlier to see if they are commensurate with our assigned mission, what effect they will have on journalistic competition and what they cost. I won't burden you with the details, many of which would probably intrigue Mark Twain, but I can briefly tell you what, among other things, we cannot do in the net. We can have no commercial advertising, no films other than those we produce ourselves, no classified ads, no price comparisons, no ratings of hotels, vacation spots, etc., and no local news. We have also pledged not to post our offerings online indefinitely, 
items of current interest like the news, but also the daytime soaps, yes we do those too, can stay up for a week. Other items for three months and our education programming for up to five years. On balance, we can live with it, even if further discussions with the press are needed in individual cases. By the way, Germany is not an exception here. Almost all countries with fee-financed public broadcasting are well aware of this issue. Then again, the whole argument may be totally unnecessary. Here in the US, where public broadcasting is very much smaller and not financed by fees, newspapers are hurting worse than in Europe, and surely not because of online competition with PBS or NPR. I said before that I want to identify two of the challenges we will have to address in the digital age. The first was our presence on the internet, the trimediality of public broadcasting. The second is learning how to take advantage of our strong point, quality, serious reporting, <coughs> expertise, objectivity, doing our best at our craft. That's our branding. This is the justification for our fees in Germany and it is the safeguard for the existence of PBS and NPR here in America, which, let me put it bluntly, cannot survive by the law of the marketplace. Quality is our strength. This was true until now, and it will be true more than ever in the age of enormous change. Many serious newspapers also offer this kind of quality. So we're all in the same boat, and it's a shame we have to argue about our presence on the Internet. The net, I've said it before, is fascinating and grand. It's a political forum and offers a means of resistance for people tyrannized by dictatorship. It is a superb marketplace, a worldwide agora. It is an almost inexhaustible source of knowledge and it spans the globe. It is globalization. But since we can't have a new efficient processor implanted into us each year, has the net made it any easier for us human beings to understand our world? The wealth of information can suffocate us. What is important, what isn't? Hundreds of television channels, 24-7 news coverage, countless radio stations, a vast network of blogs and forums. People need help to channel and sort it all out. And that makes serious media more essential than ever. And it's not just the sheer amount of often only putative information. There is also sensationalism, a frequently mindless exaggeration that selects just one story from the glut of news, plus media hype, when everyone piles on one topic, when the world seems to stand still because a Lindsay Lohan has been arrested. I won't say that uh, we at public broadcasting are free of such sins. But I think I can say we're able to avoid sharing in another danger to objective information. That is when the media are misused to advance financial or political interests, when the goal is to polarize, to paint things for the sake of those interests in black and white in order to manipulate the public. That is really a cardinal sin. As we all know, things are almost never black and white. They are always complex. The painstaking task of the serious journalist is to explain this complicated world, to translate insider talk and its shorthand, to give things some structure without distorting them. Democracy needs informed citizens who can form judgments on the basis of objective facts. Helping them do that, that is the strength of public broadcasting, precisely because it is independent. I'm sure you're asking yourself just how that sort of independence is possible and if there aren't constant attempts by the government, by political parties or other interest groups to influence our programming. There have indeed been and are such attempts. Let me give you two examples. In 1972-73, the government of my home state, Bavaria, attempted to exert greater influence on Bavarian broadcasting by increasing the number of party representatives on our broadcasting board. As you recall, political representatives on our board are in a minority. This proposal was then met with broad opposition. Journalist organizations, artists, labor unions took to the barricades and initiated a petition for a referendum. Instead of gathering 700,000 signatures required, they got more than a million. 
the upshot, the state government backed down and a firm separation between the state and public broadcasting was written into the state constitution. Something similar is currently at issue at ZDF, Second German Television, a nationwide public network. In the wake of extended quarrels over who would take over as editor-in-chief, the Federal Constitutional Court, which is the equivalent uh, to the US Supreme Court, has been charged with determining the composition of ZDF's administrative board. Public broadcasting has always been tested to withstand attempts at exerting unfair influence. First of all, our system of financing by fees helps keep us economically independent. Second, we enjoy a basis in law that makes direct political influence impossible. Attempts to pressure us, and they do occur, are done indirectly, informally, in a telephone, in a telephone call, a conversation, and so far. But the problem is not only politicians lobbying for their causes. Advocacy groups, already represented on our board, keep a close watch to make sure they get their share of the pie. And how do we deal with that? As Director General of uh, Bavarian Broadcasting, I'm open to all outside suggestions. They can be perfectly legitimate. But whenever there is an attempt to exert undue influence, we have to resist to push back. And for the 60 years of its history, public broadcasting has successfully just done that. We know that the true justification for our existence is rooted in our independence. And I would assert the fact that post-war Germany has taken such a democratic and stable course was and is as a result of its free independent press and of its public broadcasting. Ultimately, people long for some kind of orientation. We can offer them that. And so, despite these uncertain times, conjured up by breathtaking changes in technology, I'm firmly optimistic about the future of public broadcasting. In conclusion, let me return to the motto of your university. The digital revolution has been compared, and I think rightly so, to the invention of the printing press, which played a decisive role back in the 15th century in setting that wind of freedom blowing. The net creates new possibilities for freedom. But of course, the real wind of freedom is defined not by the technical means of its transmission, but by its content. That wind is the truth that can be broadcast across the globe. Modesty is in order here, but we surely can be just a little bit proud that we in public broadcasting have made our contribution to that wind of freedom. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, this was, I think, a very fair assessment, and we'll have a chance to uh, discuss it further. When Ch his former boss, Chancellor Merkel, was at Stanford uh, last year, uh, I presided over a discussion with, well, I engaged in a discussion with her. And uh, she, at the end of her speech, uh, also invoked Stanford's motto. Uh, for a German natural thing to do, obviously. Uh, and uh, the audience responded rather uh, in a very friendly and uh, strong way by giving her uh, uh, an ovation. And uh, I got carried away standing up there and gave her a kiss. <laughs> and uh, uh, I had a microphone, of course, on just like now. And uh, so I said, somewhat appalled at my own audacity, uh, uh, this is the first time I kissed a chancellor. <laughs> Whereupon she said, uh, oh, you can do it again at the end. <laughs> uh, now, I stayed away from kissing you, Mrs. <laughs> because I thought you might say, you can do it again at the end. <laughs> I didn't want to get involved in that. Dan, Dan Werner, uh, Werner, I'm sorry, Werner, all these German names is a little bit too much. Um, uh, the executive producer of MacLera uh, uh, Lera Productions. Thank you. I'm, yeah, we can. I'm going to uh, 
talk uh, briefly with a narrative arc of three points, which is the, the early days leading up to public broadcasting, the sort of the middle age in, in where we are now. I know that the title of this talk was The Future of Public Broadcasting, but Jim Lehrer wouldn't let me go anywhere and try to predict the future and tell you what I think the future is. What I can do is tell you how we got to where we are and leave it for you to help us figure out what the, what the future should be. And uh, I'm going to excuse the PowerPoint. But you, we start right at the beginning. The first three stations that went on the air in broadcasting were 9XM, which was from Madison, Wisconsin. That was a university station. That was the only station that was allowed to broadcast throughout World War I. The uh, Navy shut down all the broadcasts, but they allowed that one university station to stay broadcasting. KDKA from Pittsburgh is famous because it did the first election broadcast. They did a, in, in, in 1923, they broadcast the uh, local elections, and that was giving, public, giving radio a role, giving radio an opportunity. WEAF has two important roles in, public, in, in broadcasting history. One is it was the place where the first ad came. They did a 10-minute uh, ad about real estate, and they started putting advertising on uh, broadcasting. They also had a problem, which we've seen with a lot of our cable operators, which is they had all this airtime, and they didn't quite know how to fill it. So one of the things that they did at WEAF was they went up to Columbia and said, there's no reason for you folks to have a radio station. Why don't you come, and come down and talk? So literally, the first university lecture on radio was a Columbia professor trotted downtown and talked about Robert Browning. And they figured that Robert Browning was the good topic because that was as far as the audience could go in terms of understanding what a professor would talk about. But so the idea of the collaboration between broadcasters, commercial broadcasters, and universities was sort of, was, was, that was put in the, uh, in the hopper at the, right at the beginning of uh, broadcast. We knew that we had a limited spectrum. We had a concept that this was a, something of the public good. We had to be very careful, how do we, give, how do we divide the spectrum? Whose is it? What do we do with it? How, how do we license it? So in 1927, we had a choice. The choice, we had a revolution 200 years earlier, 150 years earlier, that helped us decide the choice. What the British did, and what our German colleagues have done, is they went to the Crown and established it. The BBC was originally established by the Crown, not by Parliament. So it would be safe from parliamentary uh, interference. And the BBC was given uh, feed, it was supported. What they said for here in the United States was we can let the marketplace do it. The commercial broadcasters made the point that there was no need for an independent public broadcasting. They were doing Robert Browning. They were already serving the public good. So there was, so the original act, 1927, the Communications Act, did not have a, a role for public broadcasting. A, a educational broadcasting. There were educational stations. Matter of fact, what, what happened was in, in 1922, going back a step, and I'm not very good on making graphs, so you all have to make the graph for yourself, but put 1922 here and put 73 here for how many stations there were. Then we go to 1925, there were 128 educational stations. But by the time we get down to 1935, the number of stations had fallen uh, down to 36. So that we can see what was happening with the commercial marketplace, what was happening in, in the educational marketplace. The, when the Communications Act uh, 1934 came, the FCC said no fixed percentages for public broadcasting, for educational broadcasting. There wasn't any such thing as public broadcasting. There's no place, we weren't going to say how, many, how much of the spectrum we should give. As a matter of fact, there was a fight over the spectrum. And, they get AM and FM was just coming, it wasn't so good, so we'll start putting them on FM. And they started moving uh, some stations there. They didn't do anything to support public or educational broad stations other than let them live at universities in the interim from the, from the mid-30s to the 50s. They, 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 were, they were there, the first license to actually give a non-commercial radio license didn't come until 1945. To give you an idea of what a stepchild public broadcasting is, we're going looking at the back past to understand the present and to understand the future, and we're talking about a stepchild. We're talking about educational broadcasting, educational radio was a stepchild in the 50s. 
and there was a deal cut, which you can sort of, you can sort of imagine the deal, uh, that you can't advertise, so you can't compete, you don't have that much spectrum, so we'll be fine, the commercial broadcasters were fine with public broadcasting because they, there was no way it was gonna be a threat. It was not possible, the rules, the game was set, there was, no, there, was not going to be a, there was not going to be a threat. Certain things happened. Here in San Francisco, one of the early uh, public radio stations in 1949 was Pacifica, which is still on the air. And they, were, they, they helped invent the idea of uh, listener support and getting their listeners to help support it. Because they were realized that even then they realized the fiscal model had trouble. So, they were, so that concept came, it was, it was sort of a Bay Area concept and came out of, and, and came out of what we were talking about. The government got back in the act. In 1952, they started licensing public TV stations. Now, imagine this. You're, you're told you can, be a pub, you can have a station. There's no national organization to support it. So you can go to your communities. You can go to your universities. You can go to school systems. And you can start a public a TV station. You may not have a lot of support in your community. You may have to scratch and fight very hard to get a station on the air, but you can do it. And, the, and from 1952 to 1967, there was no national organization that really looked out in any clear voice. There were efforts to try to create a community of public broadcasting stations. There was, a, in the East Coast, they put together uh, a network where they used to, they farmed programs around it, and there was some support for it. But basically, we're talking about a stepchild. And the, in the Broadcasting Act, 1967, uh, public, te te public television was very much a, a stepchild. PBS was created by, uh, by, through the, by CPB, and uh, which CPB came out of the 1967 Act. That was the first federal government, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 1969, they created PBS. PBS is, was an association of the stations. Now, we, we talked about the German system before, and like, there was only 12 of them. And just imagine a situation where the stations control the center, as opposed to the center control. What that meant is we, public television grew out of a system of sort of fraternal chaos, because stations control their own air. And all the years of going to public television conferences in the 60s and the 70s, 80s, they used to talk about things like common carriage and governance, and common carriage in TV terms means that all the stations across the country will play the same program at the same time. What that means is if you're trying to get an underwriter to underwrite it, you can say, look, on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, country's gonna see this. But we couldn't say that. The rules were such that public broadcasting was incapable of saying that. And it was incapable well, into, so we're talking about a stepchild. And NPR came along in 1970, NPR very quickly by the way, uh, came up with All Things Considered, like in this first year, and All Things Considered started getting traction very quickly. Uh, public television got traction in the, in in the mid-70s with Watergate, and things you, you, I don't wanna go through program by program, but by the time we got to the 80s, the question was, has, is the reason for scarcity, is the initial logic for why we have these things, is that still good? Because we now maybe maybe we don't maybe there isn't scarcity anymore, because there are other there's like Discovery, and there's the History Channel, and there's all this. They were and they were doing some good programs, and there was there was a lot of concern about that. But the quite we had the scarcity argument for giving letting public television exist as a separate entity with the PBS getting slightly more powerful. The times weren't quite so bad in terms of raising money and stations were starting to, to uh, get clout. And what was happening, and the classic example is here at, in San Francisco with KQED, is that a st strong local organization was being set up. And c through this time, public television's local roots were very strong. So we're talking about a centralized situation in, in Germany, we're talking about a decentralized situation in the United States where public television had very strong local columns and local, and, and local pillars that uh, gave, it a great deal of, uh, gave it a great deal of support. The, that support was vital by the time we get to the mid-90s. I'm just rushing through the history. Because in the mid-90s, the, we're, we're gonna zero out public broadcasting. This was the first big fight. And public broadcast, the Republicans controlled the 
the House, the Republicans in control of the Senate, Speaker Gingrich, Senator Pressler. Those were very dark times for public broadcasting. And it went to the mat. And it was saved because it had, in its own way, made roots into the community where it got to the point where people said, you know what, I really value this. I really value this. And now as we get into the modern era, you have a public television that is diffuse, decentralized, not very powerful. It doesn't even have agreement over what organization will speak for it in Washington. And we wouldn't fight about which organization is going to be the lobbyist or the talker. It was amazing. It's an amazing situation going on, and the, the back and forth. But the, the stations, because they were strong, and because they had served on this educational mission, were starting. We're getting. We're building roots. And uh, it, the reason I put Big Bird is because that was the one that was popular. But uh, the former chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, uh, Senator, uh, Congressman Livingston from Louisiana, uh, he seated the battle. He seated the zero out battle. He just said, "Big Bird beat us." Because there were too many, there, there, there were too many people, and Big Bird was too, too powerful for them. That was very important, because now we go back to the content scarcity question. Is it still scarce? Is, it, is, 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 is there a need for this enterprise? The question is being asked. But now, all of a sudden, we're asking different questions. Because yes, there's a Discovery Channel, but they're running uh, Fix Your Cars six times in prime time. And sometimes they're doing special shows. Yes, there's the History Channel. Sometimes they do terrific things. But by and large, they had gone to the marketplace and were going to a lower common denominator and leaving public television with an educational role that was unsurpassed. And I could speak with, with great pride about how it was unsurpassed in the news business. I could speak with great pride how it was unsurpassed in local documentaries, in local coverage. One of the great things that happened here in San Francisco and we're going to go back in time a little bit. Back in the late 60s, there was a newspaper strike, and San Francisco Public uh, Television did a show called Newsroom, where they got some of the people on strike, and they sat around a table, and they had the city editor ask them questions. It was fabulous. It sort of grew all around, uh, it went all around public television. It was an example of public television meeting the needs of the community. There were many others. But we look back at what, was, what we were doing then to sort of see how we meet the, the present challenge and answer the question, is there a future? One other thing, I know Joanne and others have done this, was we've gone to some of the PBS meetings. There was a guy at the PBS conferences, uh, a fellow named David Learoff from Boston. He was the vice president in charge of technology. And what he used to do is come to every annual convention and scare the hell out of us by telling us what was going on. And he would do it. He had great research. We, he, would, he would come in with an, an ad from uh, uh, Circuit City, because it was still in, in existence then. And she'd look how cheap these TVs are. Look at all this stuff that's there. Look what these people are getting. We have to meet this market. The other time, one year, he came up and he held up a DVD. And he said, this is television in a box. And he was right. We have to meet this challenge. It was a great technical challenge. How do we meet it? So people were starting to think about it. As we were moving to new technologies, there was some sense in public television that we have to respond. And there was some, they were, we were getting traction on that. And that was very, impor it was very important to who we are and what we are. Funding was bad. Funding was really bad in the, in throughout 2000. As we get to 2008 in the Great Recession, uh, I stole this from, uh, this is CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, uh, a graphic. And it shows you from the 2008 to 2013, they are anticipating a uh, $500, $500 million decline in the funding for public broadcasting. And it's not just federal funding, it's the funding for federal broadcasting. We've had a change. Imagine what it's like to deal, to get underwriters. We live in an underwriters-driven environment. Imagine what it's like to get underwriters where for 15 or 20 years of your existence, you can only sell a 15-second underwriting spot. And, they, and they, they, commercially, they can advertise a 30-second spot where you can't say things that ad commercial advertisers would say as a matter of course. We couldn't say because the law would say you can't have a call to action. 
I mean, the hands of public broadcasting were either properly or improperly, and I'm not making a judgment about that, but the hands of public broadcasting were tied in the marketplace, legitimately tied in this marketplace, going back to 1927, and back to the, we don't need public broadcasting. I mean, the, the logic was still there. So this is what, this is what the, this is the number that we're now dealing with in the, in the present. States have been cutting back. Last year, there were 23 states tried to cut back, tried, some of them, most of them succeeded in cutting back on the money for their state broadcasting networks. I picked th these three because there are three examples of where we go for the future of public broadcasting that show you some of the strength of what this network is. WHRO is a station in Norfolk, uh, Newport News, Virginia. It is owned by the school board. And there's 16 school districts that combine to operate this station. When the new governor of Virginia went to cut the, the budget of public broadcasting, significantly cut the budget of public broadcasting, the station manager from WHO fought back. And he fought back entirely on educational grounds. That public broadcasting is an educational institution. And that's where, so for that, and they, they won, they were able to hold off the changes. In South Carolina, the new governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, who is a Tea Party uh, devotee, came up and wanted to cut the budget and, and did cut it. And her, her, she was overridden by a Republican legislature. The, Repo the Republicans from her party Voted, voted the budget cuts down because public television had such support in South Carolina. We're, we're sort of doing the big bird, we have big roots. And in Iowa, and we're, now we're talking about Iowa, which is very different from San Francisco. There's, there's probably nothing similar between San Francisco <laughs> and, and, and Iowa. They and and if I, they have okay, that's the only similarity. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that in Iowa, big bird won. They used the same big bird argument, and they, got, they were able to push back cuts. So there is reason, as we look towards the future of what public broadcasting is, to say, you know what, there, there are possibilities. This chart, this shows you, uh, it's one of those great charts that goes, you know, the further you are to the left, the easier it is, the higher up you are, the, uh, the more you get. This shows you the eight possible money-making ways that public broadcasting can get money. Uh, most of them are in the hardest quadrant, absolutely the hardest. They're the most difficult, and, and they're not going to work. Those are corporate giving, getting some more support from universities. If you happen to be a university licensee, you're not, that's not going to happen. Getting support from state and local governments. I mean, they're cutting back left and right, so there's, that's, you're, you're, you're really hurting right there. Foundations are very interestingly sort of in the middle of difficulty, but they're at the very low end of giving. The good old days of the Ford Foundation coming in with $250 million to, to create public television do not happen anymore. You now have foundations that have a very different interest in what, how they want to give out their money and what they're doing, and so that becomes a very interesting and problematic question, which the stations can talk about. The number seven is essentially what we could call the German model or the British model, or that's the dream of public broadcasters, and maybe they'll give us the spectrum fee when they sell some of the spectrum, and they'll put, they'll create an endowment for public television. That's a great thing for go to meetings and they talk about it and you feel good, but it doesn't, it's, ne it's never going to happen. But that's, that's up there. The eight is the ancillary things, and there's been some movement. As a matter of fact, if you saw in the papers today or yesterday, uh, PBS is opening up a PBS Kids channel in England, a cable channel in England, where they're trying to use PBS product to get the, rev the revenues to move forward. So that's, that, that, that's, there's some movement there. But as you go forward, we're moving, towards an, we're moving towards an institution. It's an educational institution. It's a local institution. It's, a, it's an institution that's aware of the future. And it's actually an institution that uh, has an audience. This is the, what they were getting ready. And this will come out. This is the kind of ad that you will see. And Chateau, don't laugh at the numbers. He's laughing and saying, where did you guys get your numbers? Uh, but that's, these, these are the, this is, what, this is sort of the argument that public broadcasting is going to make if and when next cuts come. 
The problem we're going to have is when, next, when the cuts came in 1995, we made the argument on a flat plan. We were, we were, it was us versus them. Now, we live in an environment where schools are cutting back to four, four days of schoolroom a day, where everybody is hurting. So public television has to make its argument in a case where the pain is society-wide and it's a much different and much more problematic problem, which is why we sort of go from public broadcasting to public media in an entirely new entity. And for that, I turn to, to uh, the best, one of the best public media people in the system. Hi, I, I, I don't have the great visuals of Dan or the English skills of Ehrlich, actually. But uh, so I'll just kind of uh, try to talk and bring us towards the Q and A part a little bit to flesh out what's going on here and uh, talk a little bit about sort of the digital future. Uh, I am your local public broadcasting guy. I'm the VP of Digital Media and Education for KQED here, which is uh, both TV and radio in this particular market. And there's some other of, of us in the crowd. I won't point them out quite yet. Um, that 170 million, that's, that's about a half of all Americans every month. So we still are a very mass medium. Um, when you, we, we talked a little bit about structure, but it, it's worth sort of pointing out because there's a lot of misconceptions about public broadcasting and how it works. And it is, you know, fundamentally, the values are very similar to what, uh, across the world, but the structures are very different and it does lead to very, um, very different ways that we can approach different problems. Um, and public broadcasting in the United States, as mentioned, is sort of a federated uh, system. There's like over a thousand stations across the United States. They're all locally owned and locally operated. Um, they're all nonprofits as well. So that's a lot of advantages. Uh, and it was really set up in the 60s, you know, to really let, sort of have power at the edges, so to speak. But it also has uh, difficulties, too, when you think about the uh, new distribution channels of the internet, which are not necessarily all local anymore. Um, the finances, we talked about that, uh, but it's, it's really fascinating to see what uh, the difference in the public perception of public broadcasting finances are and what sort of the realities are, particularly in the United States, which is, I'd love to have, uh, like NHK and other places, they knock on your door if you haven't like paid your tax, you know, and things like that. Or certainly when you buy a TV set or a radio set in the United States, there's no dollars going to public broadcasting. You all know the phrases, it's uh, viewers like you, it's listeners like you, and in KQED that's uh, far more than half of our revenues every year uh, that uh, we have to raise. The uh, amount of federal funding is uh, greatly overestimated by the public. There was a survey by CNN in April. Uh, the median guess, that's the median guess, was 5% of the federal budget that goes to public broadcast. <laughs> so if you've done the numbers, that's uh, $178 billion. <laughs> Uh, the reality is it is one one hundredth of one percent of our national budget. One, one, one. So you know it's it's hard to even do what the percentage of the debt is. It's like even less than that, right? So it's about as we were showing, it's like four hundred forty-five million. Uh, it's about one dollar and thirty-five cents per American. Um, and and you can see that you know the when he was showing the numbers of public broadca uh, public broadcasting ecosystem, it's a lot more than that, of course. And that's because for every one of those, there's like $6 raised by uh, corporate, trying to sort of uh, put corporate underwriting around programming, uh, viewers like you, foundations, et cetera. So that, that little amount of money is really sort of stretched into this really uh, big thing. Um, the same survey uh, also said, even though they had this perception, what should this funding stay the same from the federal government, or should it be less, or should it be increased? Um, and only 16% should set, said it's a limit should be eliminated. So uh, you know they thought it was 178 billion dollars, and they still thought it should be, be in there. And so at a dollar 35, um, it's the same. Um, there is um, obviously one of the other misconceptions is it's just not necessarily even in public broadcasting. Um, the percentage of funding for KQED, for instance, that is made up of those federal dollars versus uh, Reading or the state of Alaska is very different. So uh, when those cuts uh, are rear their head, uh, there's a very, it's hard to say how that's going to affect the system, but definitely one of the uh, major effects is smaller markets are going to get hit really hard. So there's a universal mandate in public broadcasting to serve the entire country. And it's a very different scenario in Alaska where you have much less density and the viewers like you support is much more difficult than, a, than in a fortunate market like here. Um, we're also very fortunate to have um, 
uh, let's well, another thing about uh, public broadcasting, uh, just to note is, um, you know, we have corporate support. Some people say, you know, that's really sort of blurring the lines between. But if you look at the average amount of time uh, sort of dedicated to any of that sort of thing, uh, on a television commercial channel, it's about 13 minutes an hour. In public broadcasting, it's about three. In radio, uh, in commercial, it's about nine minutes. And in public, it's about two. So even though we're still trying to make up this gap, and others who sort of watch public broadcasting in the United States sort of said, you know, when they came out with it in 1967, the Carnegie Commission said, it'll cost about this much. And then they sort of gave about this much. And ever since, we've been sort of putting it packaged together. And that has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. Um, public broadcasting um, has uh, another sort of not well understood thing is sort of the PBS's and the NPR's and, the, uh, and they're often put in the same sentences as just like ABC or just like Disney or just like, but you know, remember from Dan's charts and remember from the beginning, uh, basically they're oversimplified. They're kind of like buying clubs in a way. So you know, the stations came first and you have all these locally owned and operated stations who said, hey, boy, it'd be great to make a big national ni nightly uh, science show, or it's, hey, it's great, or a news show, maybe is a better example, or, you know, but let's pool our money together and have an entity sort of helping us make deals to buy programming and distribute across the country. Uh, that's very different than a Disney, which can own all these entities and sort of make all the choices because they uh, commission the content, they own the content, they distribute the content. So public broadcasting has a very sort of uh, power at the edges sort of structure, which makes um, both financing uh, and you know addressing the challenges of the future uh, interesting and loves makes me love my job actually because we don't like pro small problems we like big problems uh, the values of public broadcasting are very similar though across the world uh, in in the United States free is very important uh, treating people as citizens and not consumers sort of in our blood from the very beginning uh, this underserved the notion of serving the underserved is really uh, fundamental and you know, when you think about it, sometimes people say, oh, public broadcasting is only serving older folks. And, you know, it's actually not true. You, know, you look at our children's service as an example. It very highly over-indexes for African Americans and Latinos and things like that. Uh, programming, not just driven by the numbers. Um, it's, it's easy to say, but when you actually look into it and look at how decisions are made inside public broadcasting, both decentralized and uh, we don't always have to be chasing the numbers. And that sort of shows up on our programming. Uh, there's also a, uh, uh, a distance between funders and the content. And that's increasingly important, I think, in the digital age. I mean, you all sort of see movies and how they've gone to you know, embedded advertising and sort of working with the corporate sponsor throughout. Uh, if you look at television, you look at other media. Um, you know, I was at South by Southwest Conference, and one of the biggest topics was marketers making media. So that's maybe not right or wrong, but that's a very different sort of model than a public broadcasting where we sort of have these embedded firewalls between those who fund content and the content itself. Uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting also has sort of this heat shield role between the, the federal dollars that come out, uh, including an advanced appropriation so that there's a time window delay between the current appropriation and when the funds are received, which helps. Um, uh, public broadcasting is also the most uh, trusted uh, institution in the United States, uh, seven years running or something like that. So it's, it's usually not really hard to make the case to the public. It's more you, you get caught in the political winds and things change a little bit. But uh, So let's think about sort of uh, how that applies in a few areas. Uh, Dan's here from news. Uh, news is, you know, uh, we talked about the newspaper decline. It's, it's such a... Uh, uh, dynamic time and, and, and very scary in some ways for sort of the democracy that uh, builds upon uh, free journalism. Uh, public broadcasting has obviously got a role in fact-based journalism and a more informed public. Uh, there was an FCC report that came out in June, I think that's really interesting, talking about the information needs of communities. And, you know, I oversimplify, but you, you should check it out yourself. Um, there, they said that, you know, on the hyperlocal news gathering, there's kind of this new volunteer sort of spirit coming up and sort of covering your neighborhood block and maybe the old community newspaper sort of stuff. That's being filled by the internet a little bit. The national uh, coverage, uh, the New York Times and whatnot, uh, they'll probably survive. Things are changing a lot. But one of the things the FCC and Knight, uh, which did a report that was very similar just before that, was really concerned about was this sort of middle regional sort of who's watching state government, who is 
covering uh, what we call inside KQED sometimes the broccoli beets. You know, you really need to cover this stuff. Uh, you think about education, you think about state government. Uh, you know, KQED, we have John Myers covering the state capital of California, which is no news going on ever as you watch that. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, he's seen his like decline a lot in the last uh, decade or so, as, you know, used to have many, many newspapers, have many people up there all the time, uh, less so anymore. Uh, there's not, we have Anna Tintakalos, who's a full-time education reporter. There's just not a lot of full-time education reporters, and it's, it's about half the state budget of California. It's a really important issue, but sports is fine, entertainment is okay. <coughs> used to buy the newspaper. And you got it all, right? Whether you bought it for the comics or whether you bought it for the homepage, uh, the, excuse me, <laughs> whether you bought it for uh, whatever section you bought the newspaper for, you were still paying for that Sacramento Bureau person. You were still paying for the city hall coverage. You were still paying for it. And now when it's sort of all unbundled, uh, one of the dangers of that is just the financials of that. So you look at newspapers and where do they cut most in their reporting staff? Where are they cutting most? Um, it's not necessarily in the sports. It's uh, look to their education or look to their other areas. Uh, science, as an example, KQED, uh, it's hard to tell exactly, but we think we have probably the largest science unit in Northern California anymore of any sort of reporting entity, whether they're newspapers or television or whatnot, uh, sort of just cover, covering uh, science these days. Dan was talking about you know discovery and whatnot. I actually, I was just before I came down here, I like looked at, okay, so what is discovery talking about most on their homepage? So, American Chopper, Gold Rush, Mythbusters, American Guns, Storm Chaser, and Penn and & Teller. Um, and just sort of compare that to watch Fabric in the Cosmos on Nova the, this week on, on KQED or public broadcasting. Uh, A&E is often cited, so again, just go to their homepage. Uh, their big page, uh, things are pushing Storage Wars, Gene Simmons Family Jewels, Monster-in-Laws, Hoarders, and American Hoggers. Um, and compare that to public broadcasting, we're rolling out this arts initiative. So it's San Francisco Ballet, uh, Steve Martin's doing something on early jazz, blues, folk, Women Who Rock, Il Pistino from LA Opera, Pearl Jam at 20, things like that. So um, uh, let's, education, I think, was brought up before. It's, it's often most overlooked inside sort of the public perception of public broadcasting, but it really is. I mean, if you look at the 1967 Public Broadcasting Act, I'm sure you all will right after this session. But actually, you know, it talks about, you know, it's formed for education and let's use the computers and this new fangled technology called broadcast to sort of educate the public. We were looking at uh, some, we, we had this passed around this, we found this memo from 1953 of KQED and we were like looking at what, this was before it was even on the air and they were talking about, oh, we're gonna do these great shows, you know, The Atom with Dr. Edward Teller, uh, the uh, chemistry for teenagers, um, with these weapons, the progress of medicine in solving local health problems, uh, science exploration, you know, things haven't changed all that much, actually, and you look at what KQED, public broadcasting, PBS, NPR is sort of uh, focusing on. Um, in education, we talk a little bit about sort of being America's largest classroom. Uh, we were talking about kids. It's actually the number one source of video for uh, young kids uh, in America, online video. So they're actually streaming over 100 million streams on PBS Kids uh, every month now. Uh, public broadcasting, we just launched uh, what we call PBS Learning Media, which is an online repository of free uh, digital learning objects, which is a fancy name of, you know, you all watch all those TV shows or you listen to radio. There's great little nuggets all the time that teachers have been using for literally since public broadcasting was invented, but they used to have to like tape Nova to get that one little animation of the plate tectonics sort of thing, or the, you know, whatever the genome sequence little thing that they want. So now we've sort of cut all that stuff up, put in a big online repository. It's free to uh, every teacher and actually every individual in the country to go and sort of use that as part of their uh, education. And as education changes, when we get to digital textbooks and whatnot, we're increasingly trying to include that stuff. Uh, another thing we do is we train teachers on using this stuff. So we have sort of free services. Again, part of the benefit of being decentralized is around the country we have individuals who can go out and train teachers on how to use media, and increasingly how to use making media as part of the classroom. Um, talking, all right, I got, uh, I'll give you one minute and then I'll sit down for Q&A. On thinking about distribution, uh, one of the nice benefits of public broadcasting is if you look at Hulu, if you look at Netflix and all these sort of things, there is a lot of rights and regulations and uh, you know, uh, various paywalls to sort of get into that content. And public broadcasting having a different mission 
uh, we, we are available. Uh, one of the benefits of the digital age is for us to get our stuff out there. Uh, thinking about the future, um, I have no, uh, it's, we don't have the restrictions of Bavaria about the online internet. And so we have the, the benefit of being able to sort of, David Fanning, who runs the head of, uh, is the head of Frontline for many years, said, the technology has finally caught up with our mission. So we're really actually able to use the benefits of the internet. I love the analogy about the two-way street, right? So we've always been public media. We've always been about getting user participation. Uh, now we sort of have the tools to do it. So uh, I get the exciting uh, role of being in a place that we're all trying to figure out. Uh, how do we take all this great stuff uh, and the mission that we used to have, uh, that we continue to have, and apply it to all these new platforms, whether they're making iPad apps and iPhone apps, we just launched ours whether they're doing social media, which is a true two-way street. Um, John Doerr, who's a venture capitalist around here, talks about social, local, and mobile. And those are all well, very well suited for public broadcasting. We're local. We're trying to be very social. Uh, and mobile, which media, particularly audio and video, are uh, very well suited for the multimedia universe. So I'll pause with there so we can keep going. Uh, we are obviously uh, running uh, way over time. Uh, you, uh, there will be no discussion among the panelists at the end, but I uh, will give you a chance uh, after uh, Professor Yenga has, uh, uh, has used his two hours uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that uh, uh, you can still ask questions. So get your questions ready in your mind. Uh, 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 Shanta. prepared uh, presentation here, but it, it would have, I timed it, it would have taken approximately 20 minutes, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to speak for about five minutes, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. Now, I understand that the, the mandate here is to discuss the future of public broadcasting. Um, I have to tell you that my track record as a forecaster is not especially impressive. My next door neighbor still does not speak to me after I predicted that Al Gore would be elected president in 2000. So what I'm going to do instead is simply talk about some social science research into the, the role of public broadcasting in the democratic process. And this research is... Well, I know. I, 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 have, tried, I have tried to explain this to my neighbor, but it, 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 gets, it gets to be just too stressful for her. So anyway, the work that I'm going to describe uh, sort of covers 15 European countries. Uh, it covers uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, and Australia, all of which have very strong uh, public broadcasters. And the control group for this research is the United States, uh, because the United States is basically contrary. I, I think that's 170 million people. That's a very impressive uh, uh, number. And as Dan has quite correctly pointed out, uh, public broadcasting has been hamstrung, and it's been deliberately basically screwed. Uh, so there's no ifs and buts about the fact that, that compared to the European model, uh, we have you know, relatively uh, small uh, market for public broadcasting in this country. Uh, uh, Gerhard man uh, mentioned that he watches the, uh, the, uh, the news hour. Uh, my, uh, the standard joke on the news hour, of course, is that the only people watching it are those who hope to be interviewed on it. Uh, <laughs> but, but but anyway, so what does this research tell us about, about public broadcasting? Well, it tells us that if you're, if, if you're, if you're interested in, in traditional journalism, uh, you should be a supporter of public broadcasting. Because in every single country we've looked at, we find that the public broadcaster delivers a significantly higher level of hard news programming. By hard news programming, I mean uh, news about public affairs, uh, news about current, current events. Commercial broadcasters consistently deliver soft news. So basically news about uh, um, sex, sleaze, and scandal. That's one very important distinction, that, that public broadcasting is delivering the public sphere. What about international coverage? Uh, uh, it goes without saying that we live in a globalized world, but ironically, commercial broadcasting has been dramatically, uh, not just small-scale incremental uh, fall-off here, but, but international coverage uh, on the part of commercial broadcasters is near zero. 
I mean, if I asked you to name, uh, to list the number of international bureaus maintained by ABC, CBS, and NBC, you probably, uh, even in your wildest dreams, you probably wouldn't anticipate. I'm sure Joel knows the answer, but it's, you know, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, you could put them on, the ha uh, on one hand. Uh, it's about five or six. So basically, there is no international news if, you, if you're going to be depending on a commercial broadcast. So the supply of news, the differences are quite compelling. Uh, the, public the, the public broadcaster is basically the good guy. Now, what about the impact on the viewing audience? Here, of course, there's a very uh, democratic theory leads us to, to a very clear set of expectations, i.e., we're interested in an informed electorate. Uh, Dan mentioned, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the American public is not especially distinguished in its level of public affairs information. The idea that 5%, you know, they believe that 5% of the federal budget is being spent on public broadcasting, a number only exceeded by the, the percentage, I guess, uh, going to foreign aid. Uh, so, so these studies, uh, and I'm not going to bother showing you uh, the slides. Uh, the slides will probably make you depressed uh, because they show that Americans, I mean, the plain truth is that Americans are just ignorant about current events, okay? Uh, they, if you compare the numbers with the Europeans, it's just quite shocking. I mean, the Europeans are just, they just totally dominate uh, the American public in terms of awareness of current events. Interestingly enough, if you looked at awareness of, of uh, celebrities and sports, if you looked at soft news, Americans hold their own. Uh, in fact, it's a flat line. If you look at 15 different countries, uh, public awareness of soft news, not a bit of difference. Uh, everyone knows everything. Uh, so how do we know that public broadcasting has contributed to this, uh, this knowledge gap between uh, Europe and the United States. I won't bore you with the statistical details, but essentially we track uh, individuals' exposure to news programming, and what we show essentially is that people who, who, who watch uh, public broadcasting in Europe, and the point, by the way, made about uh, uh, the German uh, and, and, and ARD is quite representative. The critical point here is that public broadcasters have a loyal audience following, not because they're great journalists, not because of their contributions to the public sphere. It's because they have developed a tremendous repertoire of entertainment programming, most notably in the arena of sports. Now, I grew up uh, in, a, in a cricket playing country, and when I was a kid, you know, I had to watch cricket. And of course, if you're watching cricket in England, you could only watch cricket on the BBC. Uh, they had exclusive rights uh, to the national cricket team in England. Of course, that's long since they've been outbid by Sky Sports. Uh, so the point I'm making here is that this huge audience for the, for the entertainment side of the public broadcaster creates an inadvertent audience for news. In fact, uh, the news, ARD runs a newscast during the halftime of the Bundesliga soccer matches. So you can imagine if every Sunday on when the NFL is on, uh, on uh, Fox, well, Fox doesn't even have any news, so uh, they wouldn't be running it. But on NBC, you might imagine what would happen if there was a, you know, NBC News Tonight comes on, or NBC News Today comes on during the halftime of the NFL game. The point is that you don't want, uh, you don't want to reach an audience consisting disproportionately of junkies. I mean, it wouldn't make much sense to, look, to do a study where you look at the impact of the news hour on the political knowledge of the people who watch the news hour. They're all junkies to begin with. Uh, there's going to be no contribution of, of the media source. On the other hand, if there are people who are watching just because they wanted to be entertained and then they get, shot, they get this exposure to the news bulletin, you get a very big increment in their level of public knowledge. So very big, briefly, what we found is that exposure to, to public broadcasting has a dramatic effect on increasing the level of awareness of current events. And secondly, and this is perhaps more important, it reduces the inequality in the level of political knowledge. That is to say, if you look at the gap between the haves and the have-nots in Europe, the level of political knowledge is quite flat. If I take people with a minimal level of education and those with a, who are college graduates, that curve is not extremely steep. In the United States, it's like this. Uh, so essentially, the point is that it democratizes the distribution of political knowledge. 
Uh, people uh, watching public broadcasting in Europe are not necessarily people drawn from the high end of the socioeconomic stratum, whereas in the United States, that is clearly the case. So in closing, let me simply say that if you're, as I said earlier, if you're a fan of serious journalism, if you're a, a fan of old-fashioned, substantive journalism, uh, you should keep your fingers crossed that, uh, that, that, that not only should we hope that uh, public broadcasting will survive, uh, we should also hope that it will thrive. Thank you. I, I hope you agree with me uh, that uh, while this took a little uh, uh, long time uh, altogether, uh, it was a marvelous seminar on public broadcasting, giving us a comparative, a historical, a structural, and uh, now again a, a comparative and educational perspective. Uh, I think it will be rare for us to pull all of this together again uh, as we did uh, here this evening. So I, am, uh, I would be happy uh, for the next 10 minutes, perhaps 15 minutes, uh, to entertain questions uh, from you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, say uh, to whom you address your question. Um, I'm actually from Germany, but I'm visiting the faculty here. Yeah. And I very much like Germany, but I think that the Germans are broadcasting. But I've been involved uh, in television. I'm uh, in HDTV technology. I've been um, involved in the introduction, and some part of it was made in Germany. And what happened is the only customers we could find early in 2003-2004 were in Japan and here, not in Germany. And I was begging the IRT in Munich, hey, come on guys, let's go, let's do it. We are, we are the front runners here, we have made the technology, let's deploy it in our country. And they said, oh, we, we can't do it, the other the private guys are keeping us from <coughs> not letting us do it. And then I, I talked to RTL. And they said, well, we got to wait until 15% of the people watch HGTV until we introduce it. RT as a, as a commercial broadcast. So we have a technology problem in Germany where we kind of, where the public and the private sector are blocking each other. And I think the internet is another good example where the public sector is blocked by the, by the mm -hmm. commercial sector. Mm -hmm. How, and in Japan it actually works. How, what's the problem? How can we repair the German system with regards to that big problem? In Japan it works. So, Mr. Willem, explain and defend the technological backwardness <laughs> uh, of German broadcasting. Well, I think you have a point here. Uh, we are traditionally a bit slow in adopting uh, the latest uh, technologies uh, on TV. HD TV, television took a while, and uh, unlike the car industry, which is very fast in adopting uh, innovation, I think it always takes a while. Um, the, the <laughs> yeah, but now they are they are all set. Um, for instance, we are one of the uh, last countries to shut down analog uh, signals of the satellite. It will happen end of April next year, and uh, when it comes to uh, radio uh, signals, we are also at at the uh, lower end. So. So Probably we do focus too much on contents and uh, sometimes mm -hmm. neglect the uh, technical side. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's probably, I can't answer uh, this really in a satis uh, satisfying way, but um, probably the critical mass, if the market is divided, if it's split <coughs> in a dual system, uh, the critical mass is never big enough uh, if only one side of uh, the two major players decides to uh, move. So um, for many initiatives we need the consensus of the commercial media and of uh, public television or radio to really move. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah. Chris, please. Um, uh, I just want to say that um, public, we no longer, because I'm a part of public growth, we don't call it public broadcasting anymore. We call it public media. And, uh, and, and the reason being is because we are public media. We aren't just uh, radio and television. So um, I say that. So Tim, do you want to address that? Um, uh, so, so public media, you know, we've, we've toyed whether you should be officially changed the name, but in, in philosophy we're sort of uh, trying to uh, structure both our operations and our visions uh, towards sort of public media. So there's li lots of implications of that. Certainly uh, how we distribute our content, 
whether you're, any way you want it is sort of the goal. Uh, any place you want it is the goal. Um, also, how, you know, people in the audience don't sort of care how stuff comes to them and whether it comes through this door or that door or what's the plumbing behind the scenes. But there's a lot of re-plumbing to do in, in all of media organizations to sort of get our stuff out to all these uh, internet connected devices, and then organizing our structures. Or you know, when when you know when we started our our project we call Quest in public in, at KQED, uh, we started with the goal of let's raise the science literacy for the Bay Area. We didn't start with let's make this television show or this radio show or this educational outreach or this online site or whatever. That was the goal, and then the team got together and structured their their organization, the publishing, the workflow, et cetera, all around that sort of goal. So we're, we're trying to do that more and more throughout public broadcasting and in our approach to every topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, the, uh, I just <coughs> learned uh, actually today that the fee structure, what Mr. Wilhelm called somewhat euphemistically a fee for service, I think we should understand is really a tax. And that is, will be formally recognized because as of January 1, uh, it will not any longer be levied on television sets or radios. It will be levied on households, which indicates how dramatic the shift to the new media is. Mr. Wilhelm and all the other public broadcasters are sitting there worried about the fact that you all will watch public television on your uh, computers rather than uh, uh, on uh, the TV. So this has now become what we in, in American and English legal jargon would call a poll tax. It's a poll tax uh, uh, on households. Just that simple. And I said to Mr. Wilhelm <laughs> when we discussed it a little bit, I said, if I were you, I would worry about the next step, that is the poll tax getting abolished. <laughs> but that's another matter. Um, it, yes, amen. In the red. So uh, in the federal funding firewall, that, that is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So uh, the, it, those small federal dollars do go to the CPB, which uh, has to distribute it by mostly by formula. And they're not uh, deeply involved in sort of the specific content decisions about, oh, this producer, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So it's sort of that money is mostly uh, goes to the stations which then buy programming the way we talked about. Um, and, and at a producing station level, you know, whether it's the WGBH Boston or KQED or whatnot, um, uh, the, the, those who raise the dollars um, have a separation between those who sort of create the content. Kind of simple, oversimplified, but it's just. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering if any of the speakers could talk to whether or not um, archive monetization in terms of some of the gems which they have in these archives from the last 50 years, if there's any plans to sell that directly to the consumer or to monetize that. And I speak from a very personal example. I was working in New York for the summer and I went to a screening of a famous production of The Rite of Spring at the Lincoln Center, which I think was from the ZDF archive. Um, I thought it was just phenomenal that they could show this in a movie theater and charge $15 for something which had been filmed in, I don't know, Wuppertal in 1967. Um, it seems like a tremendous opportunity, and I think there's a lot of issues around the, the content and the rights, license, yeah. uh, the rights licensing to do that. And is anybody doing anything innovative? Or I know the BBC is not allowed to sell, sell stuff abroad because of its fee structure. It seems like a big wasted yeah. opportunity. I can answer that just quickly, and others can do it. That's, that's dot eight in the chart for ancillary income. We have a huge problem in terms of rights and who has the rights to something. But increasingly, people are looking for clever ways to, uh, to do that. I mean, that's Lincoln Center, by the way, that's doing that, 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 that that's putting the opera out there in the movie theaters. And, 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 make, and, and it's a terrific idea. And we're, there's a constant search to do, there's a, there's a constant search to do, to do exactly that. We did a show at the, Robert McNeil did a show called The Story of English 25, 30 years ago that was a fabulous program. And, and we, he did a sequel called Do You Speak American? And we thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to reshow the story of English. We, we did it with the BBC as a partnership. And it turns out there were so many clips on the video from so many unknown sources 
that the conclusion was it was impossible. You could not re air it. You, you could never clear the rights for this project. Yeah. So Chris, a two yeah. finger, a two uh, finger intervention? Yeah, I'll, I'll address. Um, I, I sit on the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, that's why. <laughs> so uh, we actually, um, and Tim can talk about this too, we have an initiative called the American Archives. Um, and we try to pull together all these incredible footage from all over the country. We started out with the Civil Rights Movement. And um, the problem is the rights, having the rights to, to this, finding the, the filmmakers that are, you know, 40 years old, this film is 40 years old, right. trying to find the filmmakers and getting the rights to this. Mm -hmm. But in addition is, where do you house it? How do you do this? It became very complicated for us and very costly because, as Tim has indicated, we get minimum dollars from the U.S. government, which we spread out to all the stations around the country. So um, we're trying to figure out a way to still do this. Maybe Tim um, is up to date on this even more. So yeah, it's a, you know it's a technological problem, a rights problem. You know, and it's not you know every program you see usually comes from oh I think a little shot of the BBC provided us of the whatever bridge or something like that. That's part of the rights. Um, I don't think it's a big factor in the economy of public broadcasting. You know, we've been selling to Quran or whatever, asks you know for that shot of the Gold Gate Bridge for years, and you know we could all buy lunch on what it sort of provides. So I, I do think it's we'll definitely sort of be in that space. But our primary goal is uh, preservation and uh, utilization for the American public is our is what we spend most of our time thinking about when we think about preserving and making this stuff accessible. There's a little bit of sure. We could relicense a shot of the Golden Gate Bridge, but mostly uh, it's the it's the former. Um, Mr. Willem, would you like to address the question what you do with your archives? I'm happy to report that Mr. Willem brought me a little gift, and uh, it was an archive recording of Leonard Bernstein conducting Ives in Munich in the 60s. Uh, a wonderful recording. <laughs> Would you like to address yeah. any general issue? I think we are facing the same problem. Uh, since the um, legal systems are based on intellectual property and respecting intellectual property, so once um, somebody uh, who created a piece of art uh, did not sell the rights for online distribution, but just for sort of free TV, um, you have to ask him, is that included, is that not included? And uh, that for a, a huge mass of data, we have uh, so many uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces in our archives and we are not yet up to date in really having checked all the rights for every single minute. So uh, we are confronting the same type of problem and uh, for the time being we still have separate archives for radio and television and online and we want to integrate these in a first step and then we have to uh, sort of uh, come up to uh, the uh, state of the art and state of the uh, law uh, for all these um, treasures that we have. So it's an ongoing process but we have to respect intellectual property, you can't just use stuff without having asked the uh, artists. Thank you. There is a reception upstairs and uh, I think I should not any longer interfere with that reception. Uh, uh, for all of you, you are uh, invited and I kiss you all. <laughs> <laughs>